Welcome, everyone, to the API Networks podcast on a rainy, hopefully sunny where you are, November day. Um, no, it's October. It's October. Okay, it's so right. welcome to the API Networks podcast. <laughs> In case you have lots of users and need to get more API calls per minute, there's something you can apply for called the extended mode. And the one determinant for whether or not you qualify for extended mode is whether or not you're abiding by the developer policies we have on there. And so they are written in a way to guide developers to do their best work. One of the questions we usually get is why do we have this developer portal, right? So because we don't monetize, so it's like, a, what's, what's the point? And basically there are two reasons for this developer portal. The first one is foster innovation. So we really want people to build cool things with our APIs. And the other one, which is also important, is to allow people to do things in the right manner. Instead of using a third party API built by who knows, by scrapping a website and building the API in a dark manner. We prefer to put all the technology, the tools in a right way so people can use our APIs. There's the proactive work that mostly happens before something is published, right? So you're building a thing, you're documenting it in the ways you know are best to do, and then you publish it. But then once people start to use it, reactive work is really important to make room for. And that means taking time to listen to your developers and the questions they have. And if a question is asked more than twice, that definitely means it needs to find a place in documentation. Okay, so right. welcome to the Hydrodox podcast. <laughs> and I have here three guests today. One of the guests is my co-host, who isn't on it this time. <laughs> <laughs> so I am Laura Wash, one of your hosts uh, today for the podcast. And my co-host is Christoph Van Tomme, who is uh, together with me, founder at Pronovix. This is a company making developer portals, and this is how we are became to to found and support API the Docs, the conference, and now the podcast. And our wonderful, wonderful guest today is Sarah and Alvaro, who are both senior developer advocates at Spotify. Wait, developer advocates or developer evangelists? I got into this conversation recently. Which one is the right term today? I love that you asked that question. It's definitely advocates, and we can talk a lot more about it. Yes, it's advocates in our case. Yes. Yeah. Happy to be here, by the way. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> we happy to be also here. <laughs> it is my second time, actually. So. <laughs> so, Sarah, can I ask you to give us a, a little short introduction of where you are at uh, Spotify for Developers and how did you arrive to the role where you are now? Thank you, Laura, and thank you for having me on the podcast. Um, so my name is Sarah Njambi Kiburu. I am Kenyan, um, and I've been at Spotify for a little over a year now. Um, so uh, my background is in computer science, um, so that's what I went to school to study. And uh, right after uni, I found myself in the world of open source and open data. Um, so I worked for a nonprofit in Nairobi for three years called Code for Africa, and we built um, open source tools to help journalists uh, understand and analyze data and visualize it and tell data-driven de stories with it. I did that for three years and then moved on to Open Knowledge International, which allowed me to do the very same thing. Um, so build tools uh, to help civil society organizations work with government data and um, APIs to help uh, governments open up um, some of the more specific data sets that people were struggling to um, ingest and use, particularly financial data. Uh, so the project was called Frictionless Data, and I quite enjoyed, enjoyed it um, a bit. So I'd work with the engineering teams a lot and then go out into conferences to talk about the tools we build and show people how to extend uh, services that they needed on top of those tools because they were open source and our team was small. We weren't able to do this ourselves, so we needed people to have the skill sets to do it. Um, so that's what the workshops are run at different conferences will be about. 
I did that for a long time. And then I decided to join uh, an outfit called the Carpentries that will teach um, scientists and researchers how to code because these are people who are excellent in their fields, but they find themselves in a world that requires them to know how to code so that they can share their research um, and use other people's data and things like that. So I worked at the Carpentries as well at the intersection of community and writing the technical courses. Um, so my role has always been developer advocacy, listening to their needs, and then coming back to the um, internal teams I work with and sort of advocating for them. That's where the term developer advocate comes from. And um, the, the title has changed from company to company. For example, when I worked with scientists, it's a title they didn't understand. So we called it community engagement lead because that was easier to um, invite them in to interface with their role. And yeah, so after that, I found myself at Spotify, back to more technical work, uh, enabling developers around the world, use the resources we put out uh, for them so that they can expand, extend Spotify's experience um, in unique ways in the community contexts that they have. Um, yeah, it's good to be here. How long do you work there? Um, so I've been in open source and open data for and open science for about nine years and at Spotify for about one and a half. So mm -hmm. a decade plus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about the story about the, uh, the team, like a, a small central team and then an open source community that's contributing to it. Was yes. that, was that an API that you were maintaining that way? Um, you? yes. So, so, so you had like a central API team mm -hmm. that was managing the API and then people yeah. could contribute to it and ask change requests to the API that was managed by the other team. That's yeah. super, super cool because this is exactly the thing that um, Jay Bloom in a podcast interview I did a little while ago on the API Resilience podcast. Right. And what he said was his ideal model for um, uh, inner sourcing, like in for large companies or, right. in, or for, for open source. But like, um, because open source typically is seen as open source on like a code repository and then you have to run it yourself. Right. So this is different because you're yeah. you have an open source repository for code that's managed and run by a team. Yes. And that, that's that's the perfect example of, of a true platform, which is really, yeah. really yeah, yeah. So frictionless data actually got a lot of things right. Um, so they had this whole suite of libraries and APIs um, that a central team of about five developers would um, be responsible for. So, you know, right from building them from the ground up and maintaining them and communicating about the roadmap. And then there was this whole community of users from different um, um, different areas of um, expertise, so people from government, um, people from civil society organizations, newsrooms. Um, so they have completely different use cases for these APIs and libraries. Um, and so they will just extend their use cases, um, you know, and write them on top of this. And then the, te the team will work to support them in the ways that they found the core um, APIs and libraries were not able to support their use cases. Um, and it was a very good way to work because it's a nonprofit. You get funding to advance the work mm -hmm. and in, in turn you give back to the community that's, you know, adopting and using this library. So it's a really good ecosystem um, and the tools grow as the community needs grow and they, you know, so um, there's been really good um it's made a really good case for you know work that has been done in certain parts of the world mm -hmm. um other people from other parts of the world are able to borrow from that work retrospectively so like for example if kenya is a little bit behind on opening up financial data um but the uk was at that point uh, three years ago by the time Kenya gets to that point, a newsroom in Kenya will be able to borrow from um, the use case that a newsroom in the UK already had three years ago. 
and adopt because it was open source and the, the extensions were also open source, like sort of adopt that more quickly, um, which really benefits everyone in the end. Yeah. I'd love to do a deeper dive maybe on another. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. And I'm happy to connect you to that team as well. Mm -hmm. They they do incredible work. Um, so they, I'm sure they'd be happy to be a part of this mm -hmm. podcast too. Yeah. Could you repeat again? Uh, where can people uh, check this out? Um, frictionlessdata.io. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you are working at Spotify for a year and a half. Does that mean that you joined more or less at the same time as Alvaro? Yeah, so Alvaro beat me to the start date <laughs> by, yeah, I yeah. think, two months. Um, yeah, I joined in May. I, I don't yeah. remember. You in August, could be? Yes, I did, uh, yeah. And Alvaro, we know you from the yes. Amadeus for Developers developer team uh, and uh, API the Docs uh, conference attendees know the accidentally amazing variations on a theme three times in a row presentation from Amadeus, <laughs> which was the best thing ever. Um, it was not prepared. It was, <laughs> it was not on purpose. But for sure, right? for real. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, what happened since then and uh, how did you arrive to Spotify and what do you do there now? So I'm pretty much doing the same thing I was doing in Amadeus for Developers, but in a different industry. So we have also a portal, developer portal, we have APIs, we have SDKs, and we do advocacy. We talk with our developers, we listen to them, we bring all the feedback from these developers back to the company, etc. So in the end, the job is very similar to the one I was doing in Amadeus for Developers. and uh, but that things that have changed. For example, the the model or the reason why this developer portal exists is a bit different. So, you know, for developers, we have a business model model defined with you know pay as you go for APIs, different environments, etc. But now in and Spotify is different. So we have our APIs and pretty much everyone can use it as long as you you know stay to the terms and conditions that we we have in place. And but you, you don't, we don't monetize the, the APIs. And answering your question, Christophe, that's one of the reasons or the difference between developer advocate, developer evangelist. So we don't have we don't have the need of going to conferences talking about Spotify for developers, right? So mm -hmm. we are more engage with our developers, trying to understand how they use our technology, helping them, you know, to, to solve whatever problem they may have. Um, so that's the difference. So in advocacy, it's like a bidirectional communication. We talk to them, we bring all this feedback back to the company, and we come back to them and say, hey, this is uh, how we're going to go with you know, your request or your, your pack or whatever. And uh, evangelism is basically you go, on, you go on stage and you talk about whatever you want, but you know uh, you are representing a company, and that's probably the, the main reason. Mm -hmm. Do you think this distinction is actually understood by outsiders of the DevRel community? Um, Not quite, so. actually. <laughs> I, I, I think these terms have been used interchangeably enough that um, to the community, um, as long as you possess one of these titles, they expect that level of accountability that is assigned to advocacy and not so much evangelism. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I, I think I... I'd like to point out the level of trust and relationship building that is required for advocacy um, and in a way that, um, you know, you can sort of get away with um, in an evangelism role. So I imagine in an evangelism role, I need to know um, whatever it is I'm talking about, A to Z. So I'm able to answer all the questions and the goal is to onboard people. Um, but beyond onboarding them, advocacy requires that you maintain a relationship with these people so that you also understand their developer journeys, right? Um, and so you're, you're able to continue evolving the tool or informing the evolution of the tool or resource in a way that will benefit the developer's journey as that changes over time, because tech is constantly changing. Um, and so where we were at and how people were using our APIs last year might not necessarily be the same way they would want to use them this year or the same environments, right? Um, because experiences also vary and they're usually combining 
I think particularly for Spotify's case, um, it's unlikely that someone is using our P- APIs alone. They're usually combining them with other things to provide a more holistic experience that the traditional Spotify app does not provide, right? So we have to be hyper aware of these cycles um, of creativity um, and evolution in tech. So we are accounting for them in future versions of what we offer our community. Um, when we were preparing this episode, um, you marked that the key message you want to leave our listeners with is the importance of the developer's experience and empathy with these users. And I want to go into this end note in the beginning, sort of, in a controversial manner. So I don't know, maybe because we all work in this space, but it's it's such a self-evident, universal, unshakable truth. But if you say this is one of the most important things you want to talk about or you leave listeners with, does that mean that you feel that there are human or other powers that be that go against this notion? Hmm, it's a good question. <laughs> is there um, something working against this? Maybe not actively, but like as gravitation? Um, that's that's exactly the point. So probably not actively. Like, okay, uh, I'm not gonna um, pay attention to details. I'm not gonna document my APIs pro- correctly. I'm not gonna provide examples uh, for my APIs. I don't think anyone there out there is gonna think like that. Mm-hmm. But it's more like, uh, okay, so someone using your APIs reach out to uh, to you and say, hey, uh, this documentation is not clear, or I'm missing this specific explanation in this endpoint because it's not clear to me. Uh, the reaction or the, the feedback that you provide to that developer has to be empathy. You have to understand that this person uh, has a friction with your API and is suffering a frustration. So you need to understand that. You need to, to say, thank you for your feedback and bring all this information back to the company and you know act, do something about that by, I don't know, uh, updating the documentation, probably sitting down with them together to, to see if they, in case they are reporting a bug, if this is actually a bug or not, or probably this is something, or probably they are using the API in a wrong manner, you don't know. But you need to understand that people who are reporting something to your APIs are suffering a frustration and that's super important. Yeah, I I completely agree with Alvaro. Um, And I want to add two points um, to what he said. And I think I'll mention them at the beginning so I don't forget, then I'll elaborate. Mm -hmm. So the first point is um, there's been a culture in industry that um, I think one of the big tech companies put a phrasing to, and it's move fast and break things. And that's one of the big problems. Mm -hmm. And the second big problem that I see is that Um, you know, where do ideas come from, right? Like ideas for building or um, setting up the next big thing, writing the next API. Um, And the cause of friction there is that mostly it will come from internal teams and they'll sit and say, we have a great idea. Let's build an API for it, right? Um, And so right from the formation of the idea, um, the owners or or the the inspiration for it is very different from what maybe the community's experience of it is. And developer empathy is going down to check your assumptions um, and and your um, <clears throat> your ideas against what the community needs, right? And checking that against the lens of, I have this idea, it will be really great, but um, is that what is needed um, and urgently by the community? And so if the community comes back through surveys or talking to them, however you will do it, and says, yes, this is a good idea, but in this and this way, we will prefer you tweak it, developer empathy is saying, Ah, that will mess up my idea, but I need to listen to these people first and optimize for their um, for their needs over what I know will be the perfect idea. So your experiment should always involve the developer, the end user um, from the beginning, because if it doesn't, your idea grows out from version one, version two, and by the time <laughs> you realize that the community you're building for actually really needed you to pivot a long time ago, you've really gone a long ways. Um, and that's, you know, sunk cost, um, time and resources, and then it becomes hard to backtrack. So um, just listening to developers is an underrated um, 
skill um, and, and tool um, in this entire process and starting as early as possible is important. And then um, my first point was the moving fast and breaking things concept, which is, you know, uh, let's put it out into the world, see how people use it, um, and then we'll come back and iterate on it um, based on their feedback. But almost always, teams are changing. Um, their focus is also shifting, right? And so the first version of a thing will likely be the best version of that thing um, or the last version of that thing, right? Um, and so you find that things will likely be sunset uh, sooner than they will pivot to then include the perspective of developers based on feedback. And it's because of the nature of um, our companies and how fast things move and how um, quickly our attention shifts from one need to the next. Um, yeah, so those two things are the enemy of developer empathy, and it's important to be aware of them. And I think at the core of it, the, the solution is to know your potential users and involve them in the process in discussions from early on. Um, so you've designed your API before you build it out, go back to the community and ask them, this is the direction you're taking it. Does it tally with um, the developer journey that you'll have and how you intend to use it? Things like that. I think it's also you, what you were describing made me also think of about uh, empathy orchestration. Um, that uh, because there's one thing which is empathy between the team that's developing an API product and the and consumers of the API. Um, but then what what I often see is that organizations have like lots of teams that are working independently, and then like how do you turn all of I call it an API soup. How how do you turn that API soup into an API platform? How do you create something that's going to be coherent? Uh, and I think that that's probably a really important role that developer advocates play is kind of like orchestrating all of that uh, empathizing that needs to happen. And it's not just between the consumer and the producer, but also between this network of producers and their consumers and how, how it all hangs together. Um, sort of like you're, you're the catalysts on the settled points of all things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of responsibility yeah. to it. <laughs> so Spotify for developers, what's on there? You want to go first, uh, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> you can see how we all unmuted at the same time. Like, oh, best question of the day. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Um, so Spotify for developers is the one place we like to put out all the libraries, the SDKs, the APIs, the features um, that we we want our external developer community to be aware of and to, to take on and use to sort of extend the Spotify experience into their unique contexts. Um, there's lots of brilliant ideas that people have and that, you know, essentially onboard a lot of people onto Spotify itself that we are not able to build for as Spotify, right? Um, and also because we don't understand all these contexts that the ideas exist in. But by um, putting out all these resources and then documenting them, um, so there's documentation A to Z, how to use this resource, but also tutorials for if you are in this scenario and you wanted to do a thing, how do you get there? Um, just to give people a starting point, because sometimes documentation can be really detailed and it's not clear to a person where to start. So a tutorial sort of gives them that roadmap um, for a small win. Um, and then a guide sort of takes them beyond um, that small win into, so you also are um, have this developer environment and this is how you can also use it with other things that um, that, that you're using already in the environment or that exist in the developer e ecosystem. So we put out the tutorials, the guides, the um, reference documentation, um, things like change logs, which are really important, particularly to people who've um, built really fun um, and, and mature applications and sometimes something fails and that will be the first 
point of entry for them to check what changed even before they get to their blog. We also try to do to do a good job at shouting out the people that have built uh, some of the apps that are really popular um, because that also gives other people an idea of what they can do with the APIs, the libraries that we have on there. Um, so sort of inspiring people. Yeah. Um, and then we also try to shepherd people into the developer community um, because there's really great um, peer mentoring that goes on in that. Like someone will ask a question and before Josh, Alvaro, Ole or I are able to get to it, community members are right on top of it. They've given solutions or guided people in the right direction. So there's there's a really great um, peer mentoring um, relationship sort of thing that goes on in that community. It's really interesting. Yeah, that, that is impressive how people help each other in the, in the community. Um, and talking about the, the developer portal, so we have different products. We have API products like Web API or Ads API, right? So Web API it is, the, I would say, the most popular uh, product that we have in the portal uh, provides different endpoints for, for example, retrieving metadata like uh, uh, artists, albums, tracks, uh, podcasts, episodes, etc. And we have, we also have more things like uh, the web play by SDK in case you want to embed Spotify in your browser, uh, some remote SDKs for iOS, Android, etc. And the reason, one of the questions we usually get is why do we have this developer portal, right? So mm -hmm. because we don't monetize, so it's like, a, what's, what's the point? And basically, there are two, two reasons for this developer portal. The first one is, you know, foster innovation. So we really want people to build cool things with our APIs. And the other one, which is also important, is to allow people to do things in the right manner, right? So instead of using a third-party API built by who knows? No, uh, by scrapping the web, API, the, sorry, the, the web website and building the, the API in, in a dark manner. So we prefer to put all the technology, all the tools in a right way, so people can use our APIs. And it's really, really cool to see, for example, and how our APIs are used in boot camps or hackathons. Uh, so people who are learning how to integrate APIs use Spotify APIs as you know a starting point. And that is really, really cool. And you see how people are using our documentation, tutorials, et cetera, to, to really start understanding how, for example, RESTful API works. Um, that is super, super rewarding. It's really cool. So it sounds that to some extent you're um, redirecting some of the bad behavior towards uh, a channel where actually it, it is good and it's better controlled and yeah. it's not going to damage uh, the company. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. That, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's important that you've mentioned that because I, I think one of the big things we have on the portal is actually the um, developer policies, which are okay. really important to us, um, yeah. and particularly because for any application that anyone will build today, experimentally or otherwise with Spotify's resources, that application will go into something we call uh, the development mode, uh, which means you have a limited amount of API calls per minute. Um, but in case you have lots of users and need to you know, get more API calls per minute, then we give you something called, there's something you can apply for called the extended mode. And the one determinant for whether or not you qualify for extended mode is whether or not you're abiding by the developer policies we have on that. Um, and so they are written in a way to guide developers to, you know, do their best work and to win uh, without us getting in the way of the growth of their, uh, the apps they build and put out to their communities. And so it's, it's something we constantly point people back to um, for reference time and again, because it, it lays out um, the things you can and cannot do um, yeah, from Spotify's legal perspective. So that's important to mention. That, that, that's a prime example of an enabling constraint. It's a constraint that at the same time is making things easier to do, but it also also is like reducing some behavior that could be could be damaging in this. Oh, exactly. In this yeah. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, part of least resistance is actually the correct one because you're yeah. building it that way. Huh. Yeah. Really well done. Um, so I understand that you both work in the team developer experience, right? 
Yes. Um, does that also mean that is the developer experience who in practice owns the dev portal, as in um, takes care of it fully? And yeah. How many, that, how many people are you in that team? <laughs> What a time to ask that second question. Um, so for a long time, there was only Josh, um, wow. who did an incredible job. Yeah. Um, and then only our manager joined him, and he's been incredible in building the team, and he hired Alvaro and I. And we now have a designer on our team, and um, a few developer advocates um, have been hired in the hiring pipeline and will be joining us soon. So, you know, we've been four for a bit, but we are growing and growing fast. So that's exciting. So you are also maintaining and writing the documentation, the examples, the references, guides, and all of that. Yeah, correct. And also the technology that runs your portal? Yes. So uh, the portal uh, is pretty much owned by us. Uh, so we are the owners of the portal. We uh, extend it uh, whenever it's necessary. We maintain the documentation. We keep uh, uh, examples, everything up to date. Um, this is our job mainly in the company. Um, so the, the developer portal is uh, our small son, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and I love that you asked about the documentation question because this is the age-old question, who is responsible for documenting exactly. um, tech resources? And, and, you know, we could be here for days talking about whose work it is, um, but I think uh, Alvaro and I and the rest of our team have been thinking really intently about how to make that work scale um, because depending on one person or four people is really not the way to do it. Um, so while we have done it in the past and while we have handheld um, teams that have wanted us to uh, in doing it in the past, we've been trying to move on to a more sustainable approach, which is sort of writing um, best practices around some of these things in what we call a playbook that we then share with our internal teams so that if they have built an API, we're also, they, they're also able to look at the chapter in the playbook that talks about how to document APIs, when to start, what kinds of things go in there, um, and how to structure them, right? Um, so, so that really helps us. It, it, it takes us from that point where we are responsible for documenting to the place where we become reviewers of, of the work that um, the people responsible for building out the APIs are writing as well. Um, so that's been an interesting dynamic that we've started to explore. Explore. Um, and it's a lot of work. It goes beyond just writing the chapter in the playbook and then stepping aside. Uh, we've had to be very intentional about the kinds of workshops we actually bring this engineering teams to, into and at what point, uh, because you know, we talked about developer empathy before, and that's one of the key things that you need to ingrain or, or share with people, get them to that point of understanding where uh, developer empathy is at the core of everything they do. And then they understand that, you know, the API is not nearly ready until the documentation for it is ready. So there's never an instance where we are um, launching or publishing something that is not documented because essentially it's not really working that it into their workflows. And the workshops are designed in a way that helps people come to that understanding. And by the end, they're like, let's make a to-do list and let's assign responsibility. And this is what we actually need to do because they, they now understand it. So that's been a really interesting dynamic for us to explore, moving beyond doing or applying best practices to empowering teams to do that at scale um, and in a way that outlasts or outlives one specific project yeah and on top of that uh, given the uh, the inner source model that we have internally in the company we allow pretty much everyone to contribute to whatever you want like uh, okay so i found like a type on the documentation or i would love to extend this because it's not clear to me you can send a pull request and you can contribute to the to the portal or whatever project you uh, you find interesting too so that is really really cool mm -hmm. So you, you're Spotify, you use inner sourcing deliberately or, uh, yeah, and yeah. It, it's a thing. Yeah, it is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so one other thing that Spotify is super famous for, there is a certain way of working that you have, which is 
I would almost, well, judging from the outside, because I've never worked at Spotify, but it's kind of like a microservices architecture for your business, where you have like lots of decoupled teams that are doing their own thing, um, that are still collaborating and that have like a clear way of um, bringing their work products together and still being as independent as possible. There's one thing that I'm really interested in, <laughs> which is um, uh, because I, I talk with a lot of people and often when we're talking with customers, um, uh, I get this question like, yeah, we're, we're looking at backstage and we're using backstage internally. And um, and I've, I've had this discussion with analysts also, they're like, everybody's going crazy about backstage. And, um, and how and how it can be used for the dev portals. Um, well, what's really interesting is that Spotify for the external facing dev portal is not using backstage, right? You're using another stack, um, even though that you have this product. Now, I think it totally makes sense because I think there's two very different use cases. But if you want to elaborate a little bit, how is that on the inside and, and how does that work exactly? And it's a long story, I hope. It makes sense as a sentence, uh, as a question. I guess. I, <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I can. I can. I can go first. Um, think that you made a, um, a a really good point. Basically, the the audience and the the kind of developers are different. So backstage, we use backstage internally as the backbone of for the company, right? Mm -hmm. So you describe the the way we are working internally quite okay. So we have different teams, different squads, each of them uh, building something in particular, uh, like a service, and these services can interact each other via APIs. So the way we have to orchestrate all these services uh, to publish API documentation internally for other squads is through a backstage, right? Mm -hmm. So backstage, allow us to create like uh, for example you want to create a, an internal website in the company so you can go to backstage in a couple of clicks you have your website up and running right with your repository with your uh, ci cd uh, process running uh, in the background etc so backstage is allowing us to orchestrate all these different project services etc internally and the reason why we don't use backstage for our developer portal is because basically the, the the use case is different. So we have a developer portal uh, for external developers that they want basically documentation, uh, API information, tutorials, etc. So um, I think the use case is different. Yeah, um, it goes back to the question of empathy, really, because um, mm -hmm. you know you sit down and think about who will be um, using the the resources you're putting out and how will they be using every last page that you have, right? Um, so for example, you have an overview page, who is that for and how's that different from a tutorial versus the guide page versus the reference docs page. Um, and, and in doing that sort of persona exercise to define who, this, who's, who these people are um, or these um, archetypes um, are that will come and use your website, we, we, we realized it's a lot more varied, right? Like there'll be the product manager, for example, who needs to make a decision about whether the APIs we have are the right thing for their startup, right? To, to take up and use for their project. There'll be the developer who's experimenting. There'll be the teacher who wants to introduce the students to, you know, building your first app. And Spotify is a really cool way to do that, build your first app, mm -hmm. you know? So there's this whole array of, of users that come to the portal and for different reasons. And so in thinking about them, then you have to think about how to relay the, um, the same information um, in a way that will target all of them. And that's difficult to do when you have a wide audience. So um, yeah, one of the reasons why um, it's, it's a bit different and that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell a bit more about how does the, the feedback cycles with your third party developers look like and how does that influence the documentation as an artifact itself? That's what you, Sarah. 
Oh, okay. Oh, I see. <laughs> Another fun topic I love to, to talk about. I think, and I'll mention uh, the empathy thing because we talked about it early on. Um, but I also did mention that developer advocacy includes um, building trust as a big part of the role itself. Um, and so you put out resources um, and developers begin to use them and they'll definitely have questions for you. Uh, because, you know, even your best documentation um, is written by people who are privy to the thing they built. And so sometimes you forget what bits are important to call out and there'll naturally be questions. Um, and so there's the proactive work that mostly happens before something is published, right? So you're building a thing, you're documenting it in the ways you know are best to do, and then you publish it. But then once people start to use it, reactive work is really important to make room for. And that means taking time to listen to your users, uh, your developers and the questions they have. And if a question is asked more than twice, that definitely means it needs to find a place in documentation. Um, so we were lucky enough to have a central place where our developers mostly convene and ask these questions. Um, and we also have a good way around keeping tabs on the conversations that happen in spaces where you know, you're not naturally mentioned, um, you know, so like there'll be Twitter conversations about an API, but they don't necessarily mention um, the team so that we know to look out for them. We have ways to look out for such feedback as well, and then work it into the workflow. So for questions we see recurring a lot, our team will go in and actually suggest changes to the documentation, and sometimes invite the team to review, the team responsible for the resource to review before we publish it, right? But then there's bigger questions around maybe the future um, of the API where developers will hope to see it go, and that manifests as ideas, right? So people will come to the portal and say, it will be nice if we, we were able to do this and that, or if there was this endpoint um, that would expose this kind of data and that kind of data. So those are bigger asks that we definitely pay attention to and at a certain threshold decide to take back to teams um, and in that way advocate for, um, you know, the inclusion of that kind of idea in the future um, or, or the roadmap of uh, the development of that resource. Um, it's not a very straightforward ask um, because, you know, there's already business needs that are being developed for. And so striking that balance is super important. And I think that's where um, we've learned to sort of build trust both ways. Um, so take feedback from from teams and, and learn how to package that in a way that we can go back to the community. And sometimes the answer is no, but we need to, to say no and explain why. Um, because it's are people who've trusted us with the big ideas and the big questions. And so just saying no is can be very impersonal. Um, so we, we take care of that kind of relationship where we're able to package the answers in a way that helps people understand and more importantly, points them in a direction that will help them win or achieve some ways um, what they hoped to achieve. So we cannot do that with this at this point or it's not in the roadmap, but here's an alternative that you can consider using for the time being. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's primarily the developer portal um, and using that to respond to questions directly or improving documentation, then communicating back that we've done it um, or, you know, going back and talking to teams and saying, hey, we are checking, um, hold tight and coming back with um, a resolution, however, that that will take. Um, yeah. And all of this you follow up with uh, an incredible memory or you have a an airtight process for this? <laughs> 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 well um, we don't have um i mean sometimes the amount of feedback that we receive from the community could be massive uh our community is is is, uh, is, is very big mm -hmm. so uh we have we try to, to to set up some internal processes you know to track all the feedback and but i'm gonna i'm gonna say that we need to evolve the the process to something better and easier to you know to track and to to keep up to date because uh, it is really really difficult. Mm -hmm. So the process is partially in the people who are the team now. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's sort of been (laughs) invent as you go um, and prioritize for getting stuff done, which, as Alvaro said, is not ideal um, and does not scale well. So if Alvaro has a system to it and Alvaro is on holiday, um, the the system is already broken, right? And that means real community members waiting for answers Mm -hmm. probably have their apps not working in that time. So... Yeah, it's something we're actively thinking about, actually, um, and working on. So, mm-hmm. You mentioned about peer mentoring and how that is amazing that this is happening. Now, do you think that you have created something that enables it and it just became the best outlet for good intentions? Or is this because the topic itself, yeah, music, and now lately podcasts also is so popular among people that they bring their best selves to the table when it comes to music? Or is there something that you see that enables this active peer mentoring? Did you, you do something for this? Do you have a community manager for that? Mm, that's a good question. The answer is um, there's, there's a community team that um, is in charge of the forum because beyond the developer section in the Spotify community forums, there's um, other sections of it. So that bring in, you know, people who not necessarily use things on Spotify for developers, but use other resources put out by Spotify. Uh, So there's a there's a wonderful and able team that takes care of that. Um, we focus on, um, you know, the tech, the tech bit um, of the forum. But to answer your question, have we done anything to grow that community and incentivize it? Um, the answer is no. I, I would like to just acknowledge how much that community has grown organically over the years um, and they keep coming back um, and and they've done an incredible job on their own. Um, but the community team has all, also set up a champions program, which I think is one of the best ways that I've seen sort of initiate uh, this kind of culture in in even in that tech corner of the forums. Um, So these champions um, actively look out for questions and answer them, and they're very proactive about it. Um, But we've also seen that from the work they do um, and the badging that the forum affords them, you you can actually see people start to do that in turn. Like, this person answered my question, so the next time I'm there and I see a question um, sort of in the list and I'm able to answer, I just type it out. So it starts from this very small group of champions um, in an organically growing community, and then other people pick up on the culture. So that's been very interesting to see, and I just want to shout them out for that. Um, And then in some ways, the showcase that the website has also really helps because um, I have found that the people whose apps are on there um, are also... I, I don't know, there's a level of appreciation they feel, and so I'll find them answering questions time and again in the forums. Um, so I think it sort of assigns them responsibility without giving them pressure, and they're happy to do this in turn. And so that's been interesting to see that sort of peer mentoring for people starting out to build apps by people who've built them and done them for a while. Um, yeah. Would you think that? Your API is being um, non-paying, non-monetized. Maybe also plays to some to some extent into that. Like that, it's kind of. Um, I've I've thought about communities like this as kind of like what's the social capital that remains right. in the community. So like if there's a transaction, yeah, there's no social capital left because we've we've transacted. Well, maybe maybe there's a little bit left, but normally not too much. We've transacted. I've paid for this. I'm done. But if now I'm getting all this value and I'm I'm not paying for it, I yeah. feel like kind of like these are this is this awesome place. I want to give something back. Is is that what's yeah. going on? I I love that observation quite a yeah. bit. Um and yeah. I'd love Me for Vara <laughs> to weigh in. Um I haven't thought of it like that, but I like from my open source days, like there's something I loved to say, which was um, the finest form of flattery is usually adoption in in open source, right? And I feel like translating this to community, if um 
if I'm not monetizing something, I'm likely going to be more open about how I did a thing. And my joy will be in someone using my approach to do that thing or to enable that thing. So I think there's this it is a big yeah. level of truth to it I it agree. is a good, very good observation that I, I haven't you know never thought about it and that makes it a sense there's a book <laughs> that triggered all of this, this. <laughs> <laughs> which one um a five thousand year history of debt it's oh. kind of like a history of money uh which is uh it's not like a one history because it's kind of like lots of stories but it kind of opens your mind about uh, like different parallel ways of thinking about money and mm -hmm. um, and that this economical way of thinking about money that we have in the West, that that's not necessarily the single truth and that um, there's, there's a lot of other ways. Uh, well, actually, it's more nuanced and it's not that linear at all. And that there were ways of organizing in really large groups that were not this way. And it's similar with, with money that... There was a um, money exist for a very long time, but there were very, very different ways of experiencing uh, this uh, countable thing um, uh, that that did not turn everything into something that's monetized and measured in money. It's a yeah. Uh, if you're if you're <laughs> into it, it's very, very good books. Yeah. Amazing, thank you. Um, I was wondering when we will get to a book recommendation in this podcast, <laughs> and <laughs> we made it. <laughs> I also assume or presume that you do need a critical mass uh, for this kind of uh, peer mm -hmm. mentoring to grow. Um, you're not there for, I guess, from the very beginning of this community forming, but have you heard your um, colleagues, uh, Josh, I think you mentioned, talking about when you you had like a certain size of a community where, um, where helping through documentation actually popped up? Or maybe this was already the, from the very beginning internally. But also like where, when does community start to work? Because a lot of people ask me about, oh yeah, we want a dev portal with a, with a community. And I'm like, do you have a community manager? Like, no, like, okay, <laughs> well, maybe you should not start with that because it's not really, it's not going to be a good thing. Um, do, do you have any ideas about when that, like what Laura asked, like the critical mass? happened was there a shift did you hear about that mm. i love this question too because we we like to talk about the history of spotify and how we started to build um different apis and libraries um you know along that timeline um so I can't say for sure, um, and hopefully we'll have a good answer for you <laughs> um, in the coming days. But I will say that uh, before Josh was here, there was also another team um, that worked on a version of Spotify for developers. And before them, there's been, you know, like we stand on the shoulders of giants, like right mm -hmm. from when Spotify launched, there were people thinking about how do we bring this to the developer community? Um, and so it's work that has been done um, for years. Um, um, I'm sure for, for a decade or more uh, to get us to where we are. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, like Alvaro said in the beginning, Web API is one of the most popular ones. So I wouldn't be surprised that around the time that we announced Web API is when, yeah, you know, like um, the community blew up in excitement mm -hmm. and started experimenting. That would be my guess, but um, yeah, yeah, that, I guess. don't have the the starting or the, the when exactly when the community started to you know to be massive. Um, but I know so we have this developer forum, which is like a, for us the, the the reference forum when answering and helping the community, but. We also have people in on Reddit, uh, you know, asking questions and helping each other with APIs. We have people in a Stack Overflow. So the amount of people using our APIs, so the, or the sense of community in this case, it is um, difficult to measure because it's uh, pretty much everywhere. So wherever people are following you, 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 you go, you can find someone asking about Spotify APIs or even, you know, people using a medium or other blog platforms for building or sorry, writing tutorials, guides about, around our APIs, how to integrate Spotify APIs with React or, or whatever. So it is really cool to see how people are, you know, apporting to the community new content, but difficult to measure at the same time. <laughs> 
Sarah Alvaro, thank you very much for this lovely conversation. Is there a closure that you want to leave the listeners with? Yes. Um, so I, I think um, guiding principle that I'm sure we all abide by, but it doesn't hurt to repeat and echo it again, um, that the best use of anything that you build will always be thought of by someone else. And mm -hmm. so if for nothing else, um, put out the best version of it, document it well, give the best tutorials for it um, and set your, your developers up for success as they use your APIs. Cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave two ideas. The first one is again empathy with your developers. Do not assume that everything is you know well documented, because you will you might find surprises. And the second one is please adopt standards when uh, documenting and <laughs> specifying your API and do not reinvent the wheel, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alvaro. That was an important one to call up for sure. I, 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 I sense a story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sense a lot of pain and <laughs> deep, long story here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. This was a wonderful experience to talk with you. And I hope everybody heard something interesting today. And thank you, Christoph, for being my co-host today. Thank you for having me. Oh, and uh, one more shout out. Alvaro is also uh, a juror at the Deaf Portal Award. Yes, I am. So now you heard his opinions. Let's see what he thinks about your <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for the invitation again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. 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 Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guest, to Pronovix, for letting us work on this and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well. <laughs>